Thinking about leaving your soul sucking nine to five job, one of the biggest struggles I see people, especially as women, face is the idea of having that safety nest, that enticing perks and benefits, and listening to that head trash of what will people think if I leave. I totally get it and I've been where you are. That's why I created a free guide to help you if you're thinking about putting in that notice. It's called Unlocking Your Exit Plan. Discover five things you need to do before leaving your nine to five. This guide is filled with worksheets and steps so you will have handholding along the way you can download your copy in the link in the show notes and again it's totally free now back to today's episode you're listening to the hello cs dorsey podcast your one-stop shop for all things motivating while on your entrepreneur journey feeling stuck in your business or don't know where to start don't worry we've got you covered listen to some of the leading women in today's industry who have been there before to help guide you on your path now, here's your host and self-taught web designer, C.S. Dorsey. Welcome to another episode of the Hello C.S. Dorsey podcast. I have Michelle E. Watson here today. How are you doing today, Michelle? I'm doing great. Thank you, Candice. And that's awesome. So can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. I am an author and storytelling coach. I have learned over time that healing comes often when we tell our story. And so I wrote a book along those lines, telling of the different ways that I've been healed. And two highlights in there are times that I was healed from chronic undiagnosed pain by telling my story. I started coaching so that I can help other women learn to tell their story and hopefully get them on the right road to healing when doctors don't have an answer for them. It's awesome to hear. So could you tell everyone um, something about yourself that most people don't know? Oh, there's so much people don't know. Um, let's see. That I am musically gifted. I started on the accordion at six years old. And from there moved to the piano, clarinet, flute, and um, gave the oboe a shot even. But um, now i mainly focus on the piano so are you playing the piano now do you yes. play you do oh do you have oh, yeah a- i just had a lesson this morning really <laughs> <laughs> that's also do you teach uh piano have piano lessons every day or or do you uh is that something that you do consistently no i don't teach i take lessons oh you take yeah. classes oh okay. yeah i thought somebody was coming in and you were teaching no. them <laughs> I don't think I would make a good piano teacher because I'm pretty type A and um, you know all the horror stories that you hear of people who had um, really strict music teachers that would probably be me so um, I I don't think that's my gift. (laughs) So what's your goal with the lessons? What do you plan on getting out of the, the piano lessons? Well, you know, I've, I've started recently to build myself, and I don't always say it, and I guess I should, um, to build myself as an artist and storyteller. And so my intention is that when I'm before an audience and I speak, to incorporate whatever art I need to tell the story. And most of the time, of course, if you're speaking, that's going to be verbal. But I also do visual art. I'm an artist on canvas. I paint. And so I also want to be able to incorporate music, prophetic singing, and that kind of thing when I speak. And since my audience is mostly Christian and often in front of churches, uh, there's you know going to be a keyboard or something available so that I can do that when I speak. It's always a keyboard available at church. <laughs> And trust me, not all the time someone is actually sitting there. They either gone up and taking a break or something, but it's always one available in church. Exactly. <laughs> actually, it's yep. either a, it's probably three things, um, organ, keyboard, and piano. All three, yeah. depending on what church you're in, you have all right? three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and something's going to be available with keys, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Yep. So I want to talk about your book. Okay. And the title is Peaceful Heart, Healthy Body. Yes. So could you tell us a little bit about your book? Well, as I mentioned, it chronicles different healings that I've been through 
and I can't give anyone but God the glory because, you know, um, doctors don't always have answers. And so we have to be able and willing to pray and seek him and ask him for the right path to healing. Um, just a quick example is that for eight years, I suffered with back pain. It was in the, um, it was in my behind really, but you know, they consider it your hip. And so it was in my back hip, eight years of this pain and doctors didn't have any answers. They submitted physical therapy. I did uh, stretches, exercises, rest, medications of all kinds, you know, and nothing. And finally, after eight years, I sat down across from my pastor and in about 30 minutes to an hour, told him my entire life story. And I walked away pain-free and haven't had it since then. And so I knew that when it came time to write this book and to tell the story, it wasn't about me. It's about the women who will read the book and hopefully find some answers for themselves as well. And to understand that a lot of times, even though we don't consciously walk around holding on to trauma mentally, most people do not continue to hold on to their pain mentally. They move on with their life. They ignore it. They get over it, you know, whatever term you want to use for it. But your body still knows that it's there. Your body still knows the tension from that past trauma is there. And it manifests itself in chronic pain. And if there's a medical reason for your pain, you know, you have lupus, you have something diagnosable, that's one thing. But when the pain is completely undiagnosable and there's no medical cause, then it's time to look at what mental and emotional trauma may have been there that might be the cause of the pain. And so that's what I help women explore is just, you know, and I'm not a counselor, let me say that. So I'm not a licensed therapist or anything, but what I am is a listening ear. And I've learned from my own experience that that's often all you need is just somebody who will listen and not judge you, not shut you up, not blame you. Just listen. That's all you need. And so I'm just here to be that friend who is a listening ear to help you work through those things that might be holding you back and keeping you in pain. The story that did not make it into the book because it happened after the story, let me tell you that. After the book was written and published, I had just last year started experiencing this extreme pain in my neck. I could barely turn my head. I didn't want to lift my head. I didn't want to do anything. It got so bad that when my hair got wet and naturally got heavier in the shower, I could barely stand the pain. And one day, you know, I'm just driving in my car and God doesn't always speak to me when I sit down to pray and say, okay, God speak to me. I need to hear your voice. Right. He speaks to me while I'm out living and doing things. And, and so I believe the answer to healing my neck came to me and that there was a particular instance in my life that I needed to start talking about. It's not included in the book. It's not anything that I've publicly told anybody and I'm still not going to yet. Um, there will come a time that I will, but I said, I, I literally argued with God and I said, no, I'd rather have the pain. I would rather have to go through surgery. I've been through seven of them already and they're all chronicled in the book. I said, um, I would rather go through surgery than have to tell that part of my story right now. You know, I'll, I'll tell it later, but I don't want to tell it right now. And so of course the pain in my neck just got worse and worse. And I'll go to the doctor and he says, you have three things going on. He said, you've got a, two herniated discs, bone spurs, and arthritis. And they were recommending surgery. And I broke down and cried for the first time over a surgery. I'd never cried over a surgery before, but um, that did it. And so I said, I, I don't want the surgery. And I was working at a doctor's office at the time and she had um, a counselor on staff and he was a pastoral counselor. I don't know what his licensing was, if he was a quote unquote therapist or anything like that, but he was more of a pastoral counselor. And so I just sat down and I told him what had happened, you know, that I believed my healing was going to come from telling this part of my story. And that's what I was there to talk about. And after one session, I got up and the pain was gone enough that I knew I didn't need the surgery. And 
I went to get a, a second opinion after that, that was already scheduled. I'd already had a second opinion scheduled. So I um, went and got the second opinion and he said, well, the worst part is the arthritis. And so we're not going to have to do surgery right now since you're feeling so much better. He said, but I do want to go in and possibly cauterize those nerves. That way you won't feel the pain. And I said, okay, you know, let's just go ahead and do that. We'll schedule that while I'm here. Well, it came down to just a few days before the surgery, or it's not a surgery, it's a procedure. So I'm in the car with my husband and I said, I don't want this. I don't want to have this procedure. And I'm going to have to call their office before it's too late and tell them I don't want it. I said, because I'm just so tired of people cutting me open and putting me to sleep and all this stuff. And I've just had enough. And my husband, you know, he just looks at me and he's not a Christian, but we've been married for 24 years. And so, you know, he's just like, okay you know, whatever you want, baby, it's up to you. And the next day, the doctor's office called me and told me there was a problem with my insurance and they were canceling the surgery or the procedure. So <laughs> I said, well, that's fine. I didn't want it anyway. I changed my mind. And so, you know, and then, like I said, I have a, a third story that's in the book and um, about chronic pain and, and symptoms and stuff. And so you just can't deny it. And there's many articles out right now about doctors who are saying the same thing, that emotional, mental, physical trauma is causing a lot of chronic pain and people are being healed when they start to seek counseling or psychiatry or, you know, psychology, whatever other tools are out there. And what you have to be careful of though, is getting into the metaphysics of stuff and make sure that as a Christian, you're not going to a spiritual healer because a lot of them are psychic and new age, and they're not going to give you scripture. They're not going to um, uphold the integrity of the spirit and the word of God. And so that's what I endeavor to do is to be the other side of that to say, yes, there's something psychosomatic going on here, but let's look at what the word of God says about it as well. I love your story and I love your testimony. I think Thank this you. is really going to inspire a lot of people to, and especially women, because we tend to hold a lot of things in. It's funny we're talking about this because my mom was like, you need to stop holding all that stuff and you need to tell them. <laughs> because we're so you know we're so afraid of what people are going to say or what they're going to think or you know I found out as I gotten older and me being saved I've been saved since I was 21 but as I gotten older and grown in the Lord I've just come to the point where I'm just like you know what I can't let nobody kill me (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's right you know and I say it like that I can't let nobody kill me <laughs> yes because one day my mom told me she said it was a couple of years back and she said you're gonna die she said oh, if you don't start standing up for yourself she wow. said and holding all that in not saying anything she said you're gonna die all that stuff in the inside manifested and filtering and just you know and you holding on to it and then making yourself sick you cause stroke cause a yeah. lot of you know a lot of muscle pain and cause a lot of headaches and everything it just got to the point where I was just like you know what I'm just gonna have to let it go okay <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm gonna have to tell them, hey, X, Y, Z, you know, and stand up for myself, you know. And ever okay. since then, I've noticed a difference. I completely Good. noticed a difference. And in your situation, it's more of things that happened to you in your past. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. And my particular situation is things that will happen to me right now if someone says mm-hmm. something and me not standing up for myself and holding that in, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But over time, if you don't say something that does become your past. It does. That's true. That's true. So what advice do you have for entrepreneurs out there or women in general on how to take action? In this case, basically how to start speaking up, start, you know, start telling their story. Sure. I think that a couple of things need to happen. A lot of times you got to start with the basics, like understanding just how much God really loves you and he really does and he cares. And that's the first thing. So if women don't fully understand that or someone doesn't fully understand that, 
I recently started a Bible study that starts there and it's based on Psalm 139. We just had our first session this week. And so that will run for four more weeks from now. And once that's done, we'll start a new session probably in June. So they can look for stuff like that. You know, for me, I had mentors who have just spoken into my life and took me through that process of learning and understanding how much God loved me. And I want to do the same for others. Then I also have two coaching programs. One is to look at your past and just get used to telling one person your story, which would be me. I would be the listener in that case. So I'm going to walk the client through doing a genogram. A genogram is a lot like a family tree, but it actually looks at the relationships of people. You know, was this person conceived in rape? Did this marriage break up? And is this a step family situation? Is this an adopted situation? And it gives you an overall picture printout of these family relations so that you can at least start looking at that and how that may have affected you. And then verbally tell me your story as much as you want or don't want to tell, but probably those things that are the hardest to speak. After that coaching program, if they want to move on or if they are already comfortable doing that and they want to go into writing their story, they can do that. That's a separate program altogether though. That will give them the ability to either publish their story for the public or just leave it as a legacy for their families, or just hang on to it for themselves, for their own therapeutic reasons of releasing those things that have traumatized them. And as a former editor, that's where you know my expertise comes in, is let's build on this, let's draw more on this particular situation, or this thought that you're having, or you know whatever may um, be the case. So, after they go through those different steps that you stated, do you think it's feasible to have some sort of group coaching along with that? Yes. And that's going to be a third program that I'm going to start um, where they would actually get used to telling their story in a larger group setting. For those who want to, you know, you don't have to, but a lot of us feel called to tell our story publicly, whether it's as a testimony at church or it's on a stage or, you know, TEDx talk or whatever audience we may think we want to have. And so um, getting them used to those who've been silenced for so long, getting them used to telling their story in a small group may be the next step for them before they just go and, you know, tell their entire testimony to church while the elders are sitting there going, hmm, really? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, just getting them comfortable with who they are and being able to speak and they may never take it that far. That's entirely up to them. Not everybody's going to blab their story much to my mother's dismay publicly. You know, I do. <laughs> I am. I published a book on it. And, um, and my mother, you know, is the type who says, well, not everybody needs to know that, you know, you don't need to tell people that. And, and our business is our business. And, but you know what? Your story isn't your story. Your story is for other people. And maybe that's not true of everybody, but I know it's true for me that what I went through, as long as I let God use it, it's for other people so they can be healed from what they've gone through. And so that it can serve as a warning to others to say, hey, look, don't let this happen to you. Don't let you know, a rape eats you up for 14 years. Don't do it. Tell somebody. And so those are what my coaching programs are, are for, is to just build up the confidence of those who aren't used to telling their story. I think it goes back to the old school mentality, like our parents and then our grandparents and their parents and their parents, they have that mentality where you keep silent. Oh, yeah. You don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And that has to break, you know, yes. along the lines that has to be broken. And I do see it in the next generation and the generations to come that it's starting to break because people are like, no, people need to know, you know, 
this is what went on. This is how we got out of it. And, you know, this generation, I think, is a little bit too loud. They do talk <laughs> too much, okay? <laughs> Sometimes you have to be like, okay, yeah, sh- be quiet, you know? Yeah, but I know. <laughs> with certain things like that, that's how it always been. You don't ask questions about, you know, the, the, the family. You don't ask questions about uh, whose father was who. And that's something you right. just don't talk about at all yeah. because it, it seems like it's, I don't know if it's a shame thing or if that's something that's just been handed down generation after generation. I don't, I, yeah, it's just amazing to me. Well, a lot of it, okay, so there's several different things that you can talk about when you talk about that kind of subject. And that is that, first of all, my, my biggest audience, of course, is going to be women, just because that's my specialty. I am one, and that's what I have experience with. And women and minorities are part of what communication theorists call the muted group. Muted group simply means a large group of people by society as a whole have been silenced. And that's women. We can look back on old TV shows maybe and get a glimpse of what life was like back then, but we we don't really know because TV's TV. And even on Leave it to Beaver and Dennis the Menace, they had housekeepers occasionally. So so it's not like the way we're portrayed to believe. But for the large part, we've been silenced. And a lot of that is fear of shame. Women, you know, grow up in households where they're taught not to talk about stuff because you don't want to shame the family. You don't want to shame the person who did this to you. Well, the problem with that is that, you know, right now, I don't know when this will air, but as of this moment, April 10th, 2020, we are dealing with an isolation situation mandated by our government in order to help keep certain populations safe. Well, this fear of shame is self-isolating. And and so what happens in it is that you begin to think you're the only one. That even if you did tell somebody, nobody's going to understand because nobody else has been there. When the truth is that we've all been through something. I mean, not everything that people have been through is so traumatic, but we've all been through something in our lives where we had to fight the shame of that thing. That's just the nature of sin being brought into this world is that shame came with it. So what we have to remember is that you're not the only one. You're very seldom the only one who's ever been through what you've been through. So when you open up and you talk about it, you naturally build community with people who can say, oh, I've been there. That's my story. That's exactly what I went through. I was in a support group for anger because I used to deal with a lot of really bad anger. And so I was at church and, and we had this um, group. It was like almost like a 12 step program, but not really. And it was built on the word of God, of course. And so I'm telling a little bit about my story. And this woman who's a little bit older than I am walked in and was stunned because she goes, what? She's telling my story. How does she know who I am? <laughs> and it was, it was my story that I was telling. But she, in that moment, realized she wasn't the only one. We can all be there for each other. We can all empathize. Even if I haven't been through exactly what you've been through, I can empathize with the fact that you're going through something because I've been through something. So, you know, we just got to get over this whole fear of shame, the muted group. I wrote a paper in college on muted group theory, and it was based on the movie Fried Green Tomatoes. And it was an excellent paper, if I may say so myself. But so I've explored this muted group a little bit. Plus I've lived it. You know, I know what it is to finally, after 20, 30 years, tell somebody that you've been abused and have that person say, well, that's why I told you never to go with that person. Uh, No, you didn't, first of all. And second, that's not the proper way to respond to anybody who's told you anything um, about their abuse or their past, you know, and had I told that same person at the time that it happened, I would have only been 14 years old. Can you imagine telling that to a 14 year old and blaming that 14 year old for what an adult did to them? So I'm thankful that I waited and I didn't open my mouth to that particular person until decades later. 
you know, it's not just about telling your story. It's about making sure that the person you do tell your story to is a safe person. And a lot of times that's not what women get. They get this shame or how it was your fault for being with them, or it was your fault for going out of the house. It was your fault, your fault, your fault. It's not, it's the person who did it. It's their fault. And um, you carry the fault with you when you don't speak up and tell the story, tell what happened to somebody. It doesn't always matter who, but make sure it's a safe person. It's not somebody who's going to blame you. And if you've had that experience in the past where you say, but I have told somebody, I can't, I can't continue to talk about it again because I've told people and it, it did bring shame to me. They did blame me just know that not everybody out there is that way. There is somebody out there who will listen, who will not blame you. You just have to find them. I'm one of them, but I'm one of many. There are many people who will help you, who will just listen to your story and you can tell it without fear of shame. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of podcasts as well. And -hmm. a lot of groups on Facebook also that if you feel like, you're the only one, then you're not. If you go on right. Facebook and search, there's a lot of groups that have people that you can talk to that or other people, other members in that group that's been through the same thing. And also I see so many podcasts about women who has been through those type of situations, um, abuse and just having mental issues. It's so many podcasts out there and they, they're looking for guests uh, to be on there to tell right. their story, you know? Yes. So it's so many healing resources out there. Number one, God, the Bible. I definitely highly recommend reading that. Stay in prayer. And like you said, find that safe person to talk to. Yes. Talk to that yes. one person. And then when you feel, you know, courage enough, start writing, keep a journal. Those always help your feelings. Just do like a brain dump and keep it somewhere safe, you know, so nobody oh, yes. can just go through and just be like, oh, look what I found, you know? And then, <laughs> <laughs> then the next step is to be able to talk to a coach, talk to you, and then start talking in a group. And then now you can tell your story publicly, yes. you know, podcasts or, um, create your own podcast why not you know once you get to that level I know it'll be a little bit hard but you know sure it's one of them things so yep so do you have any last minute advice for our listeners out there just keep searching the chronic pain does not have to be the end of you it doesn't have to be your final story keep searching for an answer or a way to, to be healed look for that safe place to tell your story. And if you don't feel like you have one, give me a call. So where can everyone find you? Well, I can be found online at my website, which is just my name, Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E, E, -E -E, Watson, W-A-T-S-O-N.com. And I can be reached by email at the same web address, Michelle at Michelle E Watson.com. And there is a scheduler on my coaching page on my website where they can schedule a call to see what kind of coaching might be best for them. When the sign up is active for Bible studies and stuff that will also go up on the coaching page. And we'll link all of that in the show notes once the interview go live. I thank you, Michelle, so much for um, being on the show today and sharing your story, your amazing book, and these awesome tips and resources that people can go to and look for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Candace. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed the show today. Remember to subscribe to get the latest episodes and more. Head over to hellocsdorsey.com to subscribe. And remember, nothing is impossible. So make the impossible possible and take action today. We'll see you next time.